Don't think I'll need those, but I will need these. <laughs> it's nice to be here with you again uh, this morning. I've always enjoyed coming to this church and um, just experiencing the fellowship that you all have, and I look forward to what the Lord has to uh, say to us today. Uh, my favorite teacher is a man by the name of John Piper, and he has a little format that he follows before he preaches. One is to first accept the fact that it's an impossibility to convey what God wants him to convey without God's help, because it's spiritual truth being communicated to a human mind, and God is the one that has to speak through the person and also open your eyes to see and your ears to hear what he would have to say. And then after confessing his need for God's help, he trusts God to accomplish what God set him out to do. And that's the way I feel this morning. I'm very humbled uh, to be able to preach the word of God, and I ask for his help. So would you join me? Father in heaven, uh, we are a group of human beings that have a mind, we have a soul. Lord, and there's no way that we can understand spiritual truth without the help of the teacher, the Holy Spirit, to enlighten us and to bring our minds to truth. And so I ask for that this morning, Lord. Uh, thank you for what you're going to do in our midst today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we sure are living in a different day right now than we have ever faced before as a country. Uh, just going to Walmart the other day and realizing that bacon has doubled in price and butter has doubled in price and a lot of the shelves are empty of supply. And um, it's really a, an eye-opener. And I'm not going to preach on this this morning, but I just wanted to kind of introduce a thought into your mind about the second coming of Christ, because I think we are quickly approaching that event, okay? Uh, I've been raised in the church. I went to Bible school, the same church your pastor went to. And uh, I was always taught about future events, and it was always down the road somewhere. But I believe that we are watching prophecy unfold before our eyes. Um, I'll just give you one case in point. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, okay, that's after the Lamb of God is revealed in heaven. John sees him. He's introduced as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and then John looks and he sees a lamb as if it were slain. And um, after that, uh, and it's noted that the lamb was the only one found worthy to open the scroll and break those seven seals. And as the first seal is broken, John opens his eyes and he sees a rider on a white horse. Are you familiar with that? Okay, the rider is given a bow and a crown. A bow in the Greek language is the word toxon. It's the word we get poison from or toxic. The wreath, or the crown, is a wreath that completely encircles. Okay, in the Greek, I, I believe that word is Stephanos, and in the Romance languages, that word is Corona. I don't know. Is it possible that that poison Corona is what we have just experienced and are experiencing in this pandemic? You know, there are 270 countries and territories uh, in the world today. And as of March the 3rd of this year, 225 of these countries have reported 487 million cases of COVID-19 with 6.2 million deaths. Is it possible that this is a tool in God's hand to humble the human race and humble our world? And it's just the first of many signs that are to come. The second horse of the four horses of the apocalypse is a bright red horse. Its rider is given a sword with which to slay people and cause war among the nations. Is it possible? I'm not saying it is, but I'm just 
putting this out there for your consideration. Is it possible that that rider is Putin? And that red horse symbi symbi symbolizes the red army? He's causing war among the nations. The third horse is a black horse. The rider is given a set of scales and it's forecasting food shortage, inflation. Um, it says there that you could, for a day's wage, buy a quart of wheat, and for a day's wage, you could buy three quarts of barley. And I believe, David, you can help me with this, barley is a lot cheaper than wheat right now. The last horse is a, black, is a pale green horse. In the King James language, it says a pale horse. Green is the color for Islam. And that rider is named Death, and Hades follows Death. So, and it talks about one-fourth of the world's population dying. I think we're on the edge of that with uh, what's happened with the coronavirus. Virus. You know, God uses these things. He is sovereign. He is ruling the nations. And if you go back to Isaiah chapters 9 and 10, you'll see where God uses Assyria, a pagan nation, an idolatrous nation, a rod in his hand to discipline Israel who turned in rebellion against God. Amazing. And God can use any of these things that are happening in the world today and is using them. He's in control. And one thing I believe he is attempting to do is to humble this country that he founded and bringing us to our knees. And uh, I would just, uh, I would say that as we are on the very doorstep of the return of Christ, that we need to understand as a church body, as a group of believers, what God is calling us to do. And we need to wake up and do it with passion and with everything that is in us. Amen. And uh, I, I, that's just, uh, that's not my sermon, but I, I just had to say those things this morning. Um, whether or not you accept that, look at Revelation and just ask for God's help. I'm not positive about these things, but I'm getting a wake-up call myself when I read these things and see what is happening. Now to the message at hand that I am very excited about. Uh, I believe God has given us some incredible tools in Scripture that help us to be obedient to Him and have the joy of Christian living within us. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Six days before Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and is greeted by that massive crowd shouting praises to him, he performs a remarkable miracle that is a certain precursor to his own death and resurrection. It takes place in Bethany, the hometown where three of his dearest friends live. You know them to be Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. The scenario begins by Jesus getting the message that Lazarus is critically ill. And though the message is urgent, Jesus doesn't go immediately the two miles from Jerusalem to Bethany, but he hangs out there for a while, for a couple of days. And when he finally does arrive in Bethany and is greeted first by Martha and then by Mary, telling him that their brother has died, in fact, he's been in the tomb for four days. That's a pretty definite punctuation there, isn't it? He is dead. He's been dead for over four days. But then Jesus does something really interesting. In a very deliberate, calculated, intentional way, he begins to probe the essence of Martha's faith, just like I believe he desires to probe your faith in my faith this morning. The conversation begins like this with Martha saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Ever pray a prayer similar to that about something that you've been facing and wanted to go a particular way and it went south? Jesus replies very matter-of-factly, your brother will rise again. 
And then Martha, I think she's rolling her eyes at this point. That's not in your Bible, but I, I put it there. She says, I know that he will rise on the last day. And then Jesus makes this incredible statement. He said, looking directly into her, all the way down to her soul, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And I ask you, do you believe this? And I imagine after Jesus rises from the dead and ascends into heaven, this question comes back to Martha time and time again. And each time, her response becomes increasingly stronger and more emphatic. Yes, Lord, I do believe. There's no room for doubting here. Jesus wasn't asking her for an opinion or a preference. He was demanding a conviction that would form the very bedrock of her faith. He is the resurrection and the life. Contemplate with me for a moment the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Those things really happened. They took place. Jesus did die on the cross. Three days later, he rose from the dead because death didn't have the power to hold him and keep him down. Do you believe this? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 6 tells us that the risen Christ appeared to over 500 brothers at the same time. It only takes two, right, to agree on something and make it factual if they two witness, two people witness something. He is risen. And you're supposed to say, he is, he is risen indeed. I'm sorry I missed the sunrise service. I was sick that day and I couldn't get out. I planned on being there. But uh, I conducted about 40 straight sunrise services where I used to live at the camp that we had. It was an, always an amazing time. Uh, I remember ordering 82 dozen donuts every year for that event. We had up to 1,000 people that showed up at that and it was absolutely amazing. But Jesus is alive. You can be dogmatic about something you think to be true or hope to be true. But about Jesus Christ, it is more than dogma. Think of this. Ten of the 11 disciples that were left after Judas committed suicide died as martyrs believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amazing truth. Amazing truth. John the Baptist, they attempted to kill him. They attempted to boil him in oil. But God had other plans. He was exiled to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. You know, there was a man by the name of S.M. Lockridge. Ever hear that name? You ever wonder why, why they go by initials? instead of their real name. I think I know why this guy goes by his initials. His name is actually Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. <laughs> and he preached a sermon years ago that was repackaged by Tony Campolo. Uh, you probably heard it. It's Friday, Sunday's coming. Um, I listened to that several times and I kind of have it in my brain, although I didn't memorize it word for word, but it, it went something like this. It's Friday. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's dead. He's gone no more. But that was Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Mary is crying her eyes out, and the disciples are running around like sheep without a shepherd. But that was Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The Pharisees are strutting around with smug grims on their faces because the one who had trampled their turf and stole their popularity was now silent. But that was Friday. Sunday's coming. 
It's Friday. Satan and his demons are partying and dancing a happy jig because the incarnate Son of God, who had cast them out of many people and sent a legion of them into a herd of swine and over a cliff and into the water, was now hanging lifeless on a Roman cross, and they believed they were now the big boys on the block. But that was Friday. Sunday's coming. And Sunday came. The cross was empty. The tomb was empty. The veil in the Holy of Holy was ripped from top to bottom. And Jesus was and is right now alive and well. Amen. Do you believe this? Yes. Amen. Now because of these truths, you and I should be riding the crest of a spiritual wave. And we should be breathing the fresh air on the mountaintop of faith. Amen? Because our Savior won this war for us. But I think if we were truly honest about our spiritual journey, we would have to admit that we are so often blindsided by Satan's fiery darts, his temptations, his accusations, and we're often discouraged by our proneness to wander away from God and repeat some sin over and over again, sin that we promise never to do again. And the sickening pattern seems to be repeating itself over and over and over again. And the question confronting us today is this, and I hope to answer it. How can I, as a Christian, live a consistent life of spiritual victory? The key to this type of Christian living is found in an amazing, necessary visual gifted to us by God. Have you ever wondered why God commands us first to be saved and then what? Baptized. Okay. You remember Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost? That day when 120 Galileans that weren't highly educated left that upper room after being filled with the Holy Spirit and they burst out in the streets of Jerusalem where there were people from every nation there. And these people heard those uneducated Galileans speaking the language, their language, and preaching the gospel to them. Amazing truth that took place on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost. Peter got up and preached a sermon because they were wondering what happened. Maybe these people were drunk. Peter said, no, that's not the case. And he preached the gospel. And he said to them that they crucified the one God made Lord and Christ. And they were filled with fear. And they said, what must we do? Peter's response was two things. First, repent. In other words, you've been walking down this road, doing your own thing, walking away from God. Turn around. Walk in a different direction. Walk towards Christ. Follow him now. Repent and then be baptized, which was to be a testimony of the fact that they did that and were now followers of Christ. Okay? You think about it. I, don't, I, I assume most of you have been baptized in here. When you're baptized, you're taken down under the water. And that's you saying to everybody looking on, that old life is dying. I'm putting it under. I'm putting it to death. I'm burying it. And then when you come up out of the water, you come up to live in the power of the resurrection. So, we come to Romans chapter 6. And I want to read this for you. This is an amazing, amazing passage of Scripture. It says there, Paul's the author, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. 
we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Wow, that is amazing right there. Now, we like the idea of being baptized into Christ. Amen? Amen. That sounds kind of exciting. I mean, after all, Christ is the one who took a, a, a boy's lunch and with it fed about 20,000 people. He's the one who walked on water. He's the one who orders storms around. He's the one who opens blinded eyes to see and crippled people to walk. Amazing truth. He's the one that turns water into wine. He turns the tears of mourning into joy. What's there not to like about that? But then we read the next phrase, and I think it catches us off guard. Because it says we were baptized into his death. Wow. Do we sign up for that? I guess we never read what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2.21. He says, for to this you have been called, speaking about suffering, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in his steps. And where does his steps take him? To the cross, where he died. Jesus died a death he did not deserve to give us a life we do not deserve. We really want the power of the resurrection in our lives. But get this, there can be no resurrection unless there first is a death. So what must die in you and me? What has to be put to death? What has to be crucified? Our old self. The person we were before God saved us. The language we used to use, the way we used to talk, the way we used to say things, the actions we had, the way we used to think. That's the old life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Romans 6.6 6 says, We know that our old self was crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. And that's what God is interested in, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You know our Old Testament brothers and sisters had a real struggle obeying God, obeying the commandments in the Mosaic Law. And I'm not talking just about the Ten Commandments. There were actually 613 commandments that they had to follow. And in addition to that, the Pharisees and Sadducees did their own Revised Standard Version, and they added on to all those 613 laws. For example, I'll just give you one. Um, there was a law that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember that? Uh, well, the Pharisees and Sadducees decided that they would have to limit exactly what you could do on the Sabbath. For example, you could walk on the Sabbath, but you could only go a certain distance. You could pick up a weight, but it only could be a certain weight. If it went over that, you'd be violating the law. Do you know the difference between the Sadducees and Pharisees? The Pharisees believed in a resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. I think that's why they were Sadducees. <laughs> But God gave those Old Testament brothers and sisters an incredible promise, a prophetic word. Something would happen not in their time under the Old Covenant, but would happen down the road. Listen to it from Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. This prophetic word says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. In other words, that stubbornness, 
that resistant heart, that stiff-necked heart that says, I'm going to live my life my own way, thank you. He said, I'm going to take that heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That's a soft heart, a malleable, teachable heart. And then he says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Wow, what a prophecy given about 600 years before Christ was born. Incredible truth that God was going to do. And you've experienced this if you've accepted Christ because you have the Holy Spirit living within you. So let me ask this. Does that mean that God just does this victorious living for us? Is that what that's saying in Ezekiel 36? Well, yes and no. Peter says that his divine power has given us everything necessary for life and godliness. Remember that scripture? We have everything we need for life and godliness. But then Paul goes on to tell us what part we play in this victory. You see, God does the work of regeneration in our heart. Okay? You know, do you understand that, that term, this regeneration? Like turning the key on in the car. Everything's dead until you turn that key on and the spark sends, uh, it sends a spark to your chamber where the gas is there and it explodes and you begin this boom, boom, boom of your car. So, let me ask you this. How many of you have been planting a garden? Oh, come on. I know there's got to be more people in this. Is a, this is a Caroline County, the Green <laughs> County. Okay, what you did was you took a dead seed and you put it under the soil, added it down, watered it, and you walked away, and at some point in time, specific point in time, God germinated that seed, and life sprang forth from that dead seed. That's regeneration. It's where God takes a person dead in their trespasses and sins, and he puts his life inside that person, and you have this new life in Christ. That is regeneration, and that's something only God can do. But there's a part that we can play, okay? Another thing that God does that I don't want us to miss, it says in Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14, that he delivers us from the domain of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. We were in Satan's kingdom. Sometimes we don't like to even think, I never was there, you know. Yes, we were. We were born into Satan's kingdom. He's the prince of the power of the air, and we were born in the Adamic sin that was handed down to us from our first father. Uh, you don't have to teach a baby how to lie. You don't have to take him to stealing 101. If he sees a toy he likes, he's going to get it, you know, probably. You know, you have to train up a child in the way he should go. So when he's old, he won't depart from it. And I don't believe that's a scripture about salvation. I believe it's a scripture just teaching that we need to train our children to be a certain way so that they'll have that way as long as they live. You know, there's no guarantee that it's going to result in their salvation. You know. But God does this incredible work in us. And he, when he transfers us from one kingdom to another, he gifts us with two absolutely important gifts. One is his Holy Spirit. Ezekiel talked about it, going to come to live within these physical bodies of ours. And the second thing he gifts us with is this Bible. You know what this is? This is Jesus in writing. Think about it. John says, in the beginning was the Logos, the Word. And the Word was with God, and, and the Word was God, and the Word... And he was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. You know that scripture. And then it identifies the word down in verse 14 when it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John witnessed that. He lived with Jesus for three years. You know, in 1 John 1, he really talks about how they talked with him. They handled him. You know, they had fellowship with him. So he, he knew this firsthand. When God said, let there be light, that was Jesus speaking because he is the spoken, written expression of the Trinity. Okay, so 
God intends for us to know Jesus as we read this book. Listen to this verse from uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says there, and we all with unveiled face, now that's actually talking about Israel, who rejected the Messiah. They put Jesus on the cross and they said, let his blood be on us and on our children. And as a result of that, this veil comes over them. So it's hard for them to understand the Messiah. It's not impossible or understand the gospel. The Gentile world doesn't have that same veil. It says, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one level of glory to another. So as you read this book, you're getting to know Jesus. That's the purpose of it. You're beholding his image as expressed. And he's in every single one of the 66 books of the Bible. Every single one, you can find Christ. And as you read this, you get to know him. And that does this work of sanctification or transformation in our lives. But it's got to happen this way. If you're not involved in a discipline of reading God's word on a daily basis, it's not happening. It can't happen any other way. This Bible can do nothing for you. It can't comfort you when you are hurting. It can't encourage you when you are depressed. It cannot do a single thing for you as long as it remains closed. We've got to be students of the Word of God. God does not give that command to pastors and Sunday school teachers. He gives it to every single believer, male and female. We've got to immerse ourselves in the Word of God in order to understand Jesus and what He wants us to do and to become more like Him. And that's what His desire is, that we become more and more like Him. We grow up into our faith. We grow up into Christ. So these two gifts, the Holy Spirit in us, And this word to guide us makes victorious Christian living possible. But Paul puts the ball in our courts when he tells us we have to choose a discipline of obedience. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's in Philippians. Why does he say that? It is because this business of being dead to sin and alive to God is serious stuff. The gifts of the Spirit makes... Colossians 3, that I read about earlier, possible. Let me just read a few of those verses in Colossians chapter 3. If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let me ask you this question. When you were baptized, was it a declaration as the scripture designed it to be that you were leaving your old life and accepting this new life in Christ? Or did you hold on to the option to go back to some of the things that you were leaving behind if the right occasion presented itself? It's really a good question. Did you truly bury your old self, never to rise again, or does it often resurface from time to time? And if this return pattern is what you are experiencing, then my word to you and to me this morning is we need to revisit the cross of Christ that cross on which Christ died for us. And if you're constantly being blindsided by the same old sin, then I challenge you to become an assassin. Listen to what Colossians says. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. That's what God's calling us to do. Put it to death. Once and for all. And here's what we're to put to death. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, 
and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Those words that you used to say as you responded, just a gut response shooting from the hip, you know, that's to be put away. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge. That's beholding Christ as in a glass, seeing his image, okay? It's being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And then if you want to pick it up from there, in verse 12 of chapter 3, it'll tell you what things you are to put on. Basically, the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 2.20, you know that verse, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Every, every Christian here should know that verse by heart, and you ought to repeat it to yourself over and over again. Now, I live, but it's Christ living in me. And then come up out of the water of baptism in your life. This is really amazing. Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Colossians 1.11, may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. The Greek word for power in these and many other verses is the word dunamis. When the Bible uses that word, it never refers to our strength or ability, but rather God's power in and through us. Dunamis is an act of power. It's miraculous power. It's absolute power. It is power in action. It is the root word for our English word dynamite. That's pretty powerful. It's the very power that raised Jesus from the dead. Are you getting this? Living inside of us, the very power that raised him from the dead, should sin have a, a chance in our lives? Not if we're focused on that. Not if we're in the word, beholding the image of Christ, desiring to be more and more like him. But boy, it is not an easy road. It is a road of discipline. But if you're serious about Christ, you should walk that road. I'll end by an illustration, and forgive me if I've given this here before, but it's, it's one I think that really brings it to home. It's about a beggar man in India who had this little wooden bowl, and every day he would take that bowl and go into the marketplace in the city in which he lived and would sit there hoping for enough rice to take home to sustain him. And he did this day after day. And on this one particular day, he sat in the marketplace and he had gotten maybe a half of that bowl filled with rice with people that had mercy on him. And he was getting ready to pack up and go home when he saw in the distance an elephant caravan coming his way. And he got so excited because he realized if he could just get over to where he knew that caravan would pass, maybe the prince of the province who was on that one decked out elephant would give him something special. And so he made his way over there and he sat down and when the prince got closer to him, he began to shout out with a loud voice, O oh, mighty prince, have mercy on one of your poor servants. Mighty prince, have mercy on one of your poor servants. And over and over, he shouted that out. And the caravan came right up to him and a shout was given. And that one elephant that was really decked out beautifully came to a halt. A ladder was let down. And that prince climbed down the ladder and walked over to that beggar man. And he looked him right in the eyes and he said, beggar man, give me some of your rice. And the beggar sat there dumbfounded, not moving for the longest time. He's thinking, he's asking something from me. And finally, 
he looked down in his bowl and he reached down and he picked out three grains of rice and put it in the palm of that prince. And the prince just locked eyes with his for the longest time. He closed his hand up. He said, thank you, beggar man. And he turned around and he walked back to the elephant, climbed up the ladder. Ladder was raised, a shout was given, and off they went. And the beggar man just dumbfounded at what had just happened. And finally, as, as that caravan was disappearing in the distance, he looked down through the tears in his eyes and saw in his bowl three grains of gold. And it's said that he cried out with a voice that could be heard all over India, O oh, mighty prince, if I ever would have known, I would have given you everything. And that's what God's asking of us to surrender our lives completely into his hands. Everything that you're going through, the difficulties of life, he's in control. Nothing's gonna come your way but what he allows, and if he allows it, he has a purpose. Surrender completely to him. So, as I mentioned before, the ball's in our court. When we hear the word of God and, and God speaks to us, we have to decide what we're gonna do about it. And I just challenge us all this morning to give completely everything to Christ and let him do in our lives what only he can do for his glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we are so humbled by the truth of your word Lord, we are so disappointed in ourselves when we find ourselves returning to some of those old ways. Sometimes we get angry, say things we wish we didn't say. Lord, help us to put those things to death, to bury them, and to live in the power of the resurrection. I pray this for each and every one of us, not for our sakes, but for your glory. And I pray this in the name of our Savior, our risen Lord, and our coming King. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you very much.